Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com, and this is the Week and Charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you're watching a recording of this on YouTube, you can go to DaveLandry.com the day of the webinar, or any other time, DaveLandry.com slash webinar to register. Bring your questions and your favorite stock picks. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stocks and crypto picks. Crypto with the um, exclamation point, but really not a whole lot to do there. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So, what are we talk about. Well, can trading really be this simple? And that'll make a lot of sense in a couple of minutes. And then I want to follow up on the intraday VIX trading. I actually have a trade I want to show you there. In a couple that I swept into the rug, <laughs> but uh, I'll let you know how bad they turned out. And I identified an issue that I had, and I know I have, and we'll talk about that. But I want to follow up on that. I want to talk about trading route days. We had a nice little route lower this afternoon, really, really nice, and it worked out uh, pretty cool. And I want to show you a couple things that I did there. And I want to talk about the opening gap reversal that I think. John or CJ pointed out from the group, and I could have nearly missed it, and, and I can't say whether I would have missed it or not, but I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys paying attention. Sometimes an extra set of eyes can really help, but I'll, that'll make sense in a minute. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I'll just sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So here's a missed trade of the week, and, and what's aggravating is if you watch my Trading Simplified show, which is actually, which should be live tomorrow, 6-9-2022 on my website, the show I do for trading for stockcharts.com. I showed, I started showing my next 100 trades and I had a really bad stinker and this one would have, would have probably made about three or four or five times as much as I lost. And I actually missed this one. And as I said in the stock chart show, it was on Friday, and I think I also mentioned a Facebook group. I was busy closing out a bunch of options, had a bunch of stuff going on. I, I don't think I was making money, and I think Friday was a bad day, if memory serves. And by the time I got around to get, uh, looking to enter this trade, I realized that the market had closed. I actually heard the, the bell ding, and after hours, the spread was like a dollar, and I said, "That's screw it." And I probably, I probably should have worked a little harder to try to get in it. Anyway, uh, it was John who brought it up in the group, and I appreciate that. Thank you, John. John's here tonight. And with the buy at B, day one, if day one sets the high for the week, notice that, let's just for argument's sake, say this was on a Friday, I'm sorry, Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sound like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> If none of those days triggers, I'm sorry, if none of those days exceeds that day one high, then the day one high rule is in effect. So basically we buy it be, and I know everybody here knows this, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again, right? You're looking to buy the first closing high in an IPO. There's a lot of caveats involved, but that's the gist of it. And then the other thing is if day one sets the high for the first week of trading, it also has to close above that high. So you'll notice like right here was a new closing high. And looks like if you squint your eyes right here was a new closing high after the first four or five days, right? But it's not a trigger until it closes above that day one high, if that day one high sets a high for the week. And you can see what it did. And I, I said, mother, father, when I saw it, especially when on the same exact day it took off, I was losing a shit ton in another IPO. And it's just a testament for if you're if you're following something and you've got a legitimate setup make sure you follow through on it because not all of them are going to work and there is a bit of an outlier effect where those one or two big outliers and this one especially would have really really paid off nicely and and it's probably three or four k just in one account and that would have saved my my butt on the other one but it happens and i want to show you Occasionally, not every mistake I make, then you never would you never would bother following me, right? But I want to show you every now and then when I make a big a big mistake like this. 
just to show you, show you that we're all human and, and the map is not the territory. I have a friend of mine, very smart guy, just decided to start trading. And uh, he was knocking out the park for about the first week or so. And I was just thinking to myself, oh boy, here it comes, you know. <laughs> and I talked to him today and it wasn't so good. And, and I think what he's finding out quickly is the map is not the territory. It's very easy to to learn all these different things, but when you go to do them, or if you get in a real market and you've, you're frazzled and there's other things happening, situation at home or something, uh, who knows what, you know, you can get a little distracted and a little unfocused and sometimes not take a position. And as one of you guys were saying, which is very smart, he has a commitment device in that he sets an alarm close to the close, 10 minutes before the close. I have a, an alarm five minutes before the close, but maybe I need to set another alarm 10 minutes before the close, especially like on Friday when you got weekly options expiring. So you have to figure out ways to protect yourself from yourself in this business, believe me. All right, so this is some good news here. Now this was from CJ and I run an opening gap reversal scan every morning. I use FinViz and I do make it a habit of after the open, I refresh it to make sure I didn't miss anything, but it's possible I could have missed this one because I didn't see it. So I want to give CJ a shout out and thanks for that. And he pointed this out in the Facebook group. By the way, Facebook group is free, but you have to be at least a gold member of DaveLander.com. That way we're all on the same page. We, we all, all have a little skin in the game and it keeps a riffraff out. <laughs> so I've never been hurt buying at B 20, 30 minutes before the close. You know, John, that's a good point. And if it looks like it's, it, and I've done that too, and done and done fairly well doing that. Uh, John's saying that he's never been hurt buying a little early on the buy at B. Well, never's a big word. I'm sure sooner or later you will. But yeah, I've had a lot of trades where I've, I put them on like um, around 2.30 when I normally do my IPO analysis and I'll find something that looks really good and it looks like it's really going to close easily at a at a trigger. Remember, it's a it's a market on close type of order, and it does take a bit of a leap of faith. You kind of close your eyes and buy and say, "Oh well, let's just, just see what happens." Especially like on a Friday, <laughs> you're buying into an IPO, and then you you go away for the weekend, and like, "Oh geez, I wonder what's going to happen." But yeah, I hear you on that, and that's something that I probably need to work a little harder on doing is because a lot of times, just with everything going on. I won't get around to doing my IPO analysis until like the last few minutes of the day. And, and that's that's not acceptable, right? But if you if you do it a little earlier, then sometimes you get nice little follow through on that trigger day. So I, I fully agree with you on that. And that's something that I probably need to start doing a little bit more of. Anyway, this stock was in a pretty serious downtrend, as you can see. With the opening gap reversal, we're looking for a reversal back in the direction of the trend. And you can see we had a really nice gap here. Everybody gets excited, rushes in, the shorts rush to cover. And let's say you're a market maker for this stock and all of a sudden everybody in their brother wants to buy it. It's like, oh, you know what? What if I open this thing up 20 points and uh, sell it to you knowing that I could buy it back lower later in the day? And Sometimes exactly that happens. So nice gap higher. And again, we're looking for that stock to reverse intraday. So you look at in the pullback, let's say you got a pullback like this, and then the stock gaps higher, and then becomes the come come right back in. You're looking to short it. And this one wasn't the mother of all examples, but I've seen them come back in really hard. And I've actually seen them seen them go negative on the day after a huge gap, even like this, believe it or not. And that's when you really print the money. Now, in this particular case, I played options. I did play them in more than one account. So it worked out really nicely for me. And believe me, it doesn't always work out nicely. <laughs> Watch that other show I mentioned. You'll see what happens when it doesn't. In this particular case, I went deeper into the money. As you go deeper into the money, the fluff comes off. Okay, that's the extrinsic value. And I'm not a huge... Um, guru on options or anything. I just, I, I do a few little simple things like use them as substitution for stock. And in a case like this, it's like, okay, well, I'm only paying, I forget what the fluff was, and it was maybe less than a buck or whatever. And being willing to put up that extra buck 
is a lot better than putting up the margin. So in this particular case, with just two options, two options is plenty in a case like this. That's $1,800 round numbers versus $36,000 in margin. So that little bit of extrinsic value that you are paying, okay? That's so, in case, let's say the SHTF, let's say I freeze up or something, and this thing gets, goes straight up or it gets halted or whatever. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Worst case scenario, I'm not $1,800. I'm not gonna be happy, but I'll live the fight another day, okay? So let's say you got a 100K account. If you're trading two contracts on this, that's less than 2% risk. That's plausible on an opening gap reversal something like this you probably want to keep that down a little bit lower than two percent because if you take too many intraday trades at at two percent it could add up really really quick and you can get in a lot of trouble unless you're really really good at what you do but anyway so i'll put up eighteen hundred dollars versus thirty six thousand dollars and you have to kind of anticipate them with options with if you're trading the outright you can maybe wait for that opening range to be violated a little bit more. Uh, maybe the, the opening bar, wait for that to get taken out, although in this case, you wouldn't have gotten much out of the trade. But you really have to kind of anticipate them before those options get too expensive. And this is right around the time I bought. You can look at the times. The charts time are in Eastern, and these times up here are in Central, in case you want to recreate this stuff at home. And I figured four points would be enough, you know, four. $400 on one contract, and that's what, a 40 or 50% move? That's that's better than the poke of the eye, right? So I put a limit order in to sell one of those at 13 to 11. One thing I, I like to do a lot, uh, just FYI, especially with a short dated option, is let's say I get in for $2, I immediately put an order in to sell for $4, okay? So occasionally, like on a Friday, instead of putting up money to trade these uh, exchange traded funds, what I'll do is I'll buy short dated options on them, which expire the same day, immediately put an order to flip out half, and every now and then you get a little spike and then you get a free position and you're free rolling, so to speak. So digressed a little bit, but I just wanna point that out. Now, what I did was I still want to have the potential for open-ended profits, okay? Now, I don't want, 800 and something dollars worth of open profits which happened over a couple of hours to completely evaporate so one i took 400 dollars off or took if margin wise i guess uh, cash wise you take it 1200 off but four dollars profit and then i also want to still be able to participate so i've got that one option left but i got to think and it's like you know i don't want that one option which is now worth like 14 bucks I don't want to let that evaporate. That's just way too much. The stock can come right back in and I don't have that much time, right? I only have a few hours remaining in a day. So what I decided to do was cash out of one and then lay in by buying or rolling down the option. So I bought one option at 216, rolled down to 175. So I'm right at the money or a little bit above the money on that option. And then I was able to squeeze out a little bit more on that second option, about 89 cents on that. And I'm going kind of quick through this because I already already did it in another presentation, which will be posted on my website on Friday. So you can look at that one if you want a little bit more thorough explanation. And sometimes I can double up on these positions. And if, if it's really moving in my favor, and you gotta be careful because you don't wanna lose too much money, but you gotta be thinking about risk off while still trying to capture that big trend. So I doubled up, so to speak, even though I, I cashed out, put on another option, okay? And then I'm looking to leg out of that deep in the money option. And if the whole world blows up after I'm done with that trading, okay? Then I only lose two bucks on that remaining option, two bucks and change. And that's exactly what happened, but hey, that's okay. So I got rid of one at 14, as you can see. And then I left, I put one on in the process, laid into it, okay? And it ended up working out okay. I ended up losing that whole $216. Now, sometimes I've I've been able to leg into options and get the options for free. 
and that's kind of like a really cool deal. In this case, I guess you could argue that it's 216, it cost me 216 minus 89 cents if you want to look at it that way, kind of a fuzzy math way of looking at things. All right, any questions on the opening gap reversals? I know I went that through that quickly. We talk about it quite a lot though. And if you really go back, if you go back and watch a lot of those presentations, in fact, uh, I haven't done it in a while, I've just been too crazy busy. But if you go in and look at the quick clips on YouTube, and also if you're a member, a gold member, go through the Q&A. And we haven't done a Q&A in a while just because every day is Q&A now in Facebook, right? But back before we were really active in Facebook, I would do the Q&A, and, and most of the Q&A, or a lot of the Q&As are on, are on opening gap reversals. And if you just look at the Q&A, you think, well, this guy just trades opening gap reversals. Like, no. These things only come around every now and then. If I can be patient and wait for them, I'll do really, really well. But uh, it's I probably get more questions on that than a lot of the other stuff, as opposed to like the core methodology. Anyway, interesting question. Can trading really be this simple? Shifting gears here. And notice that I didn't say easy, okay? Big difference. So, I recently read a quote from Livermore, which I'll show you in one second. Basically, it just says, if it's a bull market, you'd be on the bull side, a bear market, you'd be on the bear side. And I read that from the investors, is it Quotient? And that's a book by Bernstein and um, Jake Bernstein. I haven't, I just got around to reading that. And it's, a, I guess it was published 30, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, geez. Anyway, uh, it's a pretty good book. A, a lot of the stuff I, I sort of already know, and a lot of stuff I probably need to hear again. But anyway, this got me thinking, determine where you'd be wrong, step one, right? And number two, don't be wrong. Okay, well, hang on a second, Dave. You're going to be wrong, right? Yeah, sometimes you will be wrong. So don't stay wrong. And Livermore has a really smart or good quote, I should say, about how it's okay to be wrong but you're going to lose a ton of money if you stay wrong so don't stay wrong now here's a quote i was talking about i read it in uh, bernstein's book and then um i grabbed it out of my reminiscence of a stock operator obviously the thing to do was to be bullish in a bull market and bearish in a bear market sounds silly doesn't it but I had to grasp had to grasp that general principle firmly before I saw that to put it into practice really meant to anticipate probabilities. And there's a lot to unpack here, but the main thing is obviously you want to be trading with that trend. You want to be doing things that are conceptually correct. That opening gap reversal, that stocks. That stock CRM was in a horrible longer term serious downtrend and all of a sudden it has one good day. And guess what? A lot of people are looking to get off the hook on that one. And maybe a lot of shorts are like, you know, if this thing ever bounces, I'm going to pile on it. So always think in terms of things being conceptually correct. Always think in terms of what's the most pain, okay? And it's really easy to keep your head when your head's not in the washing machine, right? So you look at something like CRM, you're not already short. You're like, oh, you know what? This big gap here, this is a gift from the gods, the trading gods, the market gods, I guess. I'm going to go ahead and short this thing. So anyway, determine if you're in a bull market or bear market, determine where you'd be wrong. And something simple like the what I call the buy line which is part of the TFM 10% system. And it's just 10% below the 50 week closing high and that's it, okay? And Baleo and Gayard did a paper and I've actually never read the paper. I just listened to uh, Dave Keller one day and he was talking about it or, or someone else. It was probably Keller, so I'll give him credit. And they did a paper on the 200 day moving average and they said where bad things happen. And bad things in markets happen below the 200-day moving average. So as a general statement, 
if you get out of the way when the market is below the 200 day moving average, you will avoid a lot of bad things. The 10% buy line will keep you out of a lot of trouble. And my thinking here when I developed the TFM 10% system was that if a market's going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% first. Now, 10% might be too small of a number and likely will be too small of a number in a more volatile market, but something like the S&P 500 works out, it works out pretty good. So as you can see here, we've got the buy line below. And what I want to show you is where bad and good things happen, okay? So Gayard and Baleo, their point was that, hey, you want to be out of the market, but you might want to be in the market if you have some sort of trend indicator keeping you in. You can see nice little uptrend there, little bits of a spill, and then the uptrend resumes, and then you had the bear market of 2000. I think some of you here are old enough to remember that. And the bull market that followed, another bear market. That was a really ugly win, 2008. And we had a little green coming out, a little red, okay? And wherever it's red, the market is more than 10% away from its 50 week closing high. So there were some sell offs in between. And if memory serves, those were pretty ugly. I do remember the, the 2015 16 sell off. That was a little uglier than it looks in the charts, but we'd had some, you might get out the way when something like that happens. And then again, we go back to green, little red here. We had some green. That red was. No, that wasn't the pandemic. That was a, a, a slide we have in 2019. Here's a pandemic slide, which is a lot uglier than it looks. And I'll show you that below. And then we were green or mostly green up until recently. And now we're back to being red again. And I guess with today's action, we're very red. Now, if you look at the chart below, this just is a measurement of it, okay? This will always be a fixed 10% below that 50 week closing high. And this measures how far away you are from that closing high. So you can see these bear markets, here's a 50% haircut. Here's almost a 50% haircut back here. So you lost half your money. And I don't know how I could drive this point home. I know everybody here understands, but to the layman, and that's why I wrote the layman's guide to trading stocks. I did, gave it to a friend of mine, you know, worried about the market. I, I gave it to him three months ago. I, I bet you $100. I wouldn't even take that bet. It's, you know, if I were you, I wouldn't take that bet. That he, he hasn't read it yet because I checked about a month later and the market was really doing bad. I said, you read, you, I just want you to read that one chapter. And he hasn't done it yet. So head in the sand, I suppose. But let's say you were a longer term investor. And you got out of the way, let's say twice in here and maybe three times for this pandemic thing. And technically that could be a whipsaw, but let's say you did get out at least during these 50% spills. Well, you would have a hell of a lot more money than losing half of your money and starting over twice. And I just can't drive that point home enough. Now, by the way, uh, whatever, I have some trend indicators that I like and I'm proud of, obviously. But you're going to find if you're using a trend type of indicator, they're all going to sort of look the same. And I, I suppose that's OK. So just pick your favorite ones. And I have a few different ones I like to look at, such as the Landry Light. I like the 30 EMA a lot. And obviously the 10% buy line, the TFM 10% system for the S&P 500, et cetera. But anyway, so getting back to the 200-day moving average that Gerd and Vallejo we're talking about, at least that's what I think hearsay <laughs> they were talking about. Uh, and again, I'll have to dig that paper out. I promise to do that eventually. But if you were to take a weekly chart and divide that 200-day moving average by five, if my math is correct, that would be the same as a 40-day weekly moving average. So this 40 week moving average is going to look a lot like a 200 day moving average or exactly like on a weekly chart. So if we take that and notice Landry light and notice that we were mostly above it, we had a little spill here, mostly above it, this whole 
route here or uh, ride higher. I guess it was a route. Late 90s was a route, right? Nice little trend higher again, a little bit of a spill. And then finally, the market tops out. There's your bear market. And then mostly above the moving average all the way up, way below the moving average all the way down. And you could see where their research makes a lot of sense, right? Where bad things happen. And this is what I would call like the diaper change moment from there to there is probably 40%, 40%, probably 50 something percent in this slide. So you want to definitely get out of the way when the market is not healthy. And you will get whipsawed here and there as I preach every week. As my buddy Greg Moore said one time when he was visiting and I later read it in his book, whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. Nice little green leg higher here, as you can see. And there's that 2015 and 2016 spill again. And that doesn't look too ugly on the chart. So you're like, oh, I could have held through that. Eh, I don't know about that. And I had a lot of stocks setting up on the short side. I got knocked out all my longs. I know that for a fact. And it was a really ugly time in the markets. And I would be more impressed if you got out the way and lost money doing so than if you just held right through it. Just like the friends and family that held through that pandemic slide. It's like, well, you know, that'll work until it don't. And right now we might be in one of those it don't periods. Anyway, you get the idea, green, little red, some more green, little red. And, you know, maybe this could help you with like longer term market timing. Okay, green and then a little red. Now, one of my friends, it's like this big mystery to him. First of all, what I do, <laughs> and he's like, well, if I get out, how will I ever get back in? It's like, okay, well, you can ask me, or you could probably use some free little tools on the internet, such as just a moving average or something. And if you have uh, if you have stock charts ACP, you can use the buy line. I have Landry Light and ACP, that's free. I have Landry Light, which I think it's called Daylight and Metastock, and that's free. So there's a lot of tools out there, and a lot of them are free. And you might not even need a quote feed for that. Or, of course, you can ask me. Anyway, another example here going a little bit quicker. You can see with the Landry light down below, mostly red doing bear markets, mostly green doing bull markets. And obviously, we're red again. Okay. And this is the 40 day, I guess in this case, 40 week moving average. And this is a weekly chart the landry light is just again for those who don't know i mean i guess again for anyway for those who don't know highs less than the moving average it's red highs touching the moving average or lows touching the moving average it's zero and then lows greater than the moving average it's green and this little histogram at the bottom just counts the number of days it's been green and i've done really really lengthy presentations on this going back probably maybe even 10 years now. But one thing I pointed out is when it gets super, 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 super extended, let's say 100 days or 100 weeks or whatever, closing in 100 weeks, I wouldn't rush I wouldn't rush out and sell all your stocks, but it might be a good time to not get too caught up in a euphoria. You could have a blow up in the market. It might be a good time to lighten up a little bit and then get ready for the next cycle because usually you'll have a bit of a correction after that. But as you know, markets can stay overbought for a long time. So don't rush out and sell everything, but lighten up a little bit certainly would not hurt. I struggle with how and when to get back in. All in, scale in, I think I'm better now. I missed out a lot due to fear of getting back in the past. Okay, well, two, two things here. I guess we're talking about the overall market. Uh, I'm an all or none kind of guy, okay? And I would I would be all in and all out. Now, I'm usually not, except in more recent years, I do have some money where I am doing a little bit longer term trend following just because the money cannot be traded. It's, it's tied up and it's kind of a long story, but it's not a lot of money, but it's a little bit and like lately, what I've done is I've got two mutual funds and they're like uh, energy related mutual funds, but I'm all in. The entire account is in those two funds and I'm, I'm following the TFM 10% system. 
and uh, my my girls have some college funds and when i got the tfm sales system a while back i pulled them out 100 percent. so i'm a 100 percent kind of guy most the majority of my trading is done as trading so if you go in and look at the archives of the portfolio uh, for those who aren't familiar daveliner.com slash archives you'll see coming into this mess we had quite a few longs on and then we got stopped out of all except one and it's still doing pretty good knock on wood up 300 percent and changed a little bit less today but it was up 330 percent i think yesterday or day before and I just let the portfolio knock me out. The stops knock me out, so to speak. And that becomes like an ebb and a flow. And you'll notice that if you go back in, not that long ago, up until just recently, in fact, nothing's really triggered in a while. But I think we've been a month without setups and then maybe six weeks without a new trigger. And we were looking at uh, DKS for a while, Dick's Sporting Goods. It's funny about it, my daughter. <laughs> I'm going to digress. Imagine that. Well, my youngest was, was, she's a trip. My youngest is a trip. And when she was younger, uh, she's 20 something now, but when she was younger, she had this little coupon book and uh, she was selling them for, to raise money for whatever. And uh, I said, okay, just, just flip to one and point to it and, and read it to me and tell me what the coupon is. Let's just see where we can go buy some stuff or whatever. And uh, she flipped the one, uh, she flipped the page and I pointed without looking. And she goes, uh, I, 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 I can't read that. And I'm like, why? She goes, it's a bad word. I'm like, what? <laughs> so we just read it. She goes, dicks, sporting goods. I'm like, oh, ah. Uh. <laughs> and I didn't think she knew these things. Anyway, I digress. All right, let's get back to trading before we get in trouble here. So you can see here, again, we, we, I shift the gears and I went to Bitcoin just for S and Gs. And this run here, I, I had the math in my head the other a, a little while ago, and I forgot it already. But it's a uh, thousands and thousands, maybe a ten thousand percent run. I wouldn't get too excited. It, you know, it's, it's funny. There's going to be some idiot out there that's going to sell you a system that makes ten thousand percent in Bitcoin, and I guarantee you nine thousand five hundred percent or nine thousand and ninety nine whatever percent is going to be based in this big run here. But you can see using the same kind of analogy, you can see okay, you want to be out of the market when that happens and in some cases if you're a little bit more aggressive maybe short and then long or look to get long when it's green out or look to short when it's red okay you kind of get the idea okay looking at the landry light lows greater than moving average little red here little green there now i'm not saying follow this 100 percent mechanically but just kind of use this as a guideline and one thing I was thinking about when I was putting my slides together earlier is that I had a friend and he bought a stock and then he bought more when it started dropping and he bought more when it started dropping and, and he justified each excuse the average down and average down and average down and average down. And I draw a big, I drew a big, a big blue arrow on the chart and he goes, well, that's in hindsight. I was like, okay. Settle down, Beavis. You said you bought here, okay? And it didn't look like it was in a trend at that point, but let's just assume that you bought there. And I'll give you that first trade or purchase investment. But you know, you bought here, and then you bought here, and then you bought here, and then you bought here, and here, and here. So from your second or third or fourth purchase, purchase down to your 20th purchase, we could draw a big blue arrow there okay and that is not in hindsight and the company is now bankrupt for what it's worth okay john says can I email you in more detail it's 4k 401k related yeah absolutely and uh i'm just going to tell you some simple things like i just said uh, tfm 10 percent system on some of that stuff and and I, i'm not a longer term investor but I'm willing to trend follow and be a trend following moron as long as something moves in my favor. And like the AR, ARLP, which I think you might be in because you're in the service, we've been in that one for a year and a half, okay? And, and even though I'm a swing trader, and even though I took a trade today for 10 minutes, I really want to position myself to, to make these longer term trend trades because that's where the money is. All right, uh, I wanna to touch base just real quick on the TFM 10% system. 
So the sell signal and market timing, as I often say, is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. So I just showed you those two haircuts of 50%. And then we had the pandemic, which was 30 something percent or 40%, forget how much it was, but it was substantial. And even though it came right back, at least you would be able to sleep at night. And I had a lot of friends that weren't able to sleep at night. And that's why I did a whole show on market timing last August, August 27th, I think of last year when the market was making new highs. I'm like, you know what? Let's get ahead of this before the bomb blows up. Anyway, so the sell signal to get out the way is just a, a close below the buy line or 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high. This is a weekly chart and a close below the 50 week moving average. You know, it'd be, be kind of cool. I, I did 50 50 just to make the math easy, but it'd be interesting to maybe use a 40 week moving average with this. So we're looking at that 200 day moving average, such as uh, Mr. Baleo and Mr. Gayar did. So that might be kind of a, I know you want to party with me, but that'd be kind of a fun thing to do, right? So anyway, we had a sell signal because it closed below both of those, okay? And then we had another sell signal here. And I, I fielded a ton of questions. Wasn't there a buy in between? Well, I didn't see it until one of you guys in the group pointed it out, but yes, it was a buy in between. But you could barely see the Landry light. You can't even see it on this chart. And then the market was already beginning to implode for the week. So in a case like this, as I said, I did a whole show a while back just on the or part of a show on designer's intent. In a case like this, you know, it's on weakness. I'm a trend guy. I buy on strength. So even if I, I'd have seen the signal because it was so weak, I'm like, well, that certainly can't be a buy signal. So again, one of you guys pointed out, I would wait maybe until it closed above this high, okay? And I did go back historically kind of casually. I didn't, I didn't go through a heck of a lot of detail, but I did go back and look 20 or 30 or 40 years to see if it would make that big of a difference. And I don't think it'd be that big of a difference if you just took it mechanically versus not buying when it's weak. And one of the, the rules I was thinking is like, okay, two bars of Landry light above the 50 week moving average, closing within 10% of the 50 week high. Okay, those are the, the real rule, the actual rules. And then maybe this week's close greater than the prior week's close or greater than the first bar of Landry light. So maybe this close here up here to be an official buy. I, I would I would be hesitant to add too many rules because then you start curve fitting. But I think in a case like this, that's conceptually correct and you're really not bending the rules that much. Now I'm a discretionary guy, okay? I, I, I guess, like I said earlier, I might do a couple of things somewhat mechanically like this, like some funds that I have tied up that I can't really uh, be touched. They're qualified funds. I think that's the right word for it and my girls leftover college funds, I just kind of follow this longer term thing and follow a system. But even in doing that, I would not have put them back in. I mean, what would the world be without a hypothetical question, said Mr. Wright, but even if I seen this signal in time, I wouldn't have put them back in given the weakness in the market. So it's good to have some sort of mechanical edge, but it's okay to use your mind, use your brain, and use a little discretion around that. So again, we had another sell signal. So we're under, we're still under that sell signal now, that last one that where it sold off. Okay. Pretty persistent run as well. You mean that you'd run higher? Yeah, persistency is a is a really cool thing. I mean, you know, again, you want to part of me, right? But persistency is a wonderful thing. And I'm gonna show you persistency on an intraday basis, which is pretty damn cool. All right, lately I've been talking about VIX. I got VIX fever. And one thing I've learned over the past couple of weeks is if I had a little bit more patience, you might not see my fat ass again, because if you are patient, something like the VIX can be a gift. From the market gods okay but you have to be patient so let me t show you what i'm talking about 
So the S&P 500, I put it green this week so you can see the background. Notice that it just chopped sideways for a couple of weeks. And when we look get to the live charts, you'll see that again. Okay. And you can see the VIX just kind of died out slowly in here. And one thing to notice is if you take a look down below, and I don't know if you can read the formula or not, but all I'm doing is I'm comparing the high minus the low because if you're trading something like this intraday, you don't have the benefit of the opening gap reverse or the overnight trading, right? So you can only trade that range during the day. So that's what I pay attention to as far as whether or not I'm in a choppy day or not. And like I just said, if I could be really patient, patient and especially avoid these less than 50% ranges, and you guys in Facebook, I could cut and paste these formulas if you need them. Everything I do is fully disclosed, as you probably know, no secret indicators. But you can see those two days were very narrow range days and very choppy and certainly nothing to do on those days. Now, last week, a week prior, whenever I did the last show, I talked about a route day being a day trader's dream. And today wasn't exactly a route, but if you were patient enough, at the end of the day, we had a beautiful route lower. And you could see the market just chopped back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what I did all morning long, I didn't make one single trade and I was paying attention to this range. And I don't remember exactly what it was. I could check my trading journal, but it was probably like a 20% range a 30% range of what the market normally does. So that was telling me, you know what, Dave, don't get too excited. This thing is just chopping around like it has been lately. So just sit on your hands. And I did get chewed up a few days in some of this fluff. And that's why I said earlier, if I had a little more patience, you might not see my fat ass again. <laughs> I just wait for an afternoon noon like today. So in a case like this, sit in your hands. And I've been sort of taking my own medicine lately. I tell people, you want to be a good trader, keep yourself super busy. So today I worked on these slides, believe it or not, most of the day. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, right? <laughs> Looks like a third grade I did them. But anyway, I did. And that kept me from trading too much. And when it began to break down, as you know, sometimes a breakdown could be a fake out, okay? But once it looked like it was beginning to get established, I went in and shorted the futures and I'll show you what I did, the VIX. So as this thing began to drop, jumped on the futures, jumped on the VIX. And one thing that's really cool, and I was watching this before we broke down out of the range, we probed the top, the top of the range and then these lines I've drawn in here are just the two bar highs and you can see so this is a two bar high. We don't know that until this bar here, right? But so that becomes a two bar high, then this becomes a two bar high, then this becomes a two bar high, and so on and so forth. And this thing did not make a two bar high for a long, long time. Now, George mentioned persistency. Persistency is just the market's ability to go down day after day after day. In a case like this, this these are 15 minute bars. So you can see this thing persisted lower all afternoon. Very good day to trade or very good afternoon to trade now the vix was a gift today it didn't go as far as i thought it should or as much as i wanted but i'm not going to complain because i did okay now coming into today and this is the initial premise that i've that i had okay and if you watch the last two vix presentations i did this will make a lot more sense. If you're lost in this one, go in and watch those and then come back to this presentation. This was what I was looking for and I found a bunch of other good stuff and I found a bunch of other stuff that I might want to avoid like the narrow range trading. But in this particular case, if you look at where we opened, okay, this is where we opened and this is where we close relative to the 10 day simple moving average so in this particular case we're 12 percent anything 10 percent or more away from the vix i'm sorry anything in the vix 10 percent or more away from the 10-day simple moving average 
I considered consider stretched, kind of like the CVR3 modified signal that I did back in the layman's guide to trading stocks, except that was a short-term trading system. And I'm not a huge fan of a purely short-term trading system because you can get killed really bad. And again, not the last week at week at Bandcamp, you, but if you go in and look at those prior VIX presentations and, and you go way back, you'll see that in one, I showed where like something like the CBR3 printed money. But if you go back to some of the, like the pandemic and all, you would have gotten absolutely crushed trading that short-term system. So from all that research, I started 20 something years ago, I had the epiphany like, well, what if I just went in intraday when the time was right? Well, when the time was right is a key phrase in that sentence. And one way to know is one, you're stretched away from that moving average. And two, you began to revert back to that mean and you do it on an expansion of range. So notice today we crossed over 100%, okay? And we actually closed the day, it's 130% move. And notice the prior day was less than 50%. I hope I didn't trade the VIX yesterday. I don't know if I did or not, I don't remember. I don't think I did, but if I did, shame on me, okay? Because it was a less than a 50% move. So again, 12% away on the open. So we're stretched. You begin to see it revert back to the mean, but you gotta be careful because you might just have a little narrow bar here where it blips up and then it comes right back in. So make sure you have at least a 50% move here, okay? So it's kind of like the TFM 10% system with the 10% buy line. If a market's gonna go 50% lower, it's gonna go 10% lower first. So if this thing's gonna go 100%, or like 1,200% range increase, like we showed a couple of weeks ago at Bandcamp, <laughs> then it's gonna have to go at least 50% and at least 100% first. So I don't think I'm patient enough to wait for 100% plus days in a day like today. I don't know if that would have paid off waiting for it to make it to at least 100%. If somebody wanted to do the math on that and let me know, this is the high minus low, obviously divided by yesterday's 10-day average true range, and that's to keep today's range out of the formula, okay? So we comp compared it to where it was. And uh, let me know where 100% would have been on uh, on the VIX, and that'd be, that'd be kind of a cool thing to look at. By the way, in my, and I'll give you the formula, in my VIX chart, on my live charts, I actually have a band at 100%. So it moves up and down with the price until the top, the high or the low hits it. But it gives, it gives you, it shows you how much it would have to move to make 100% either down or up. And then the band just kind of moves along with the price, which is kind of cool if I say so myself. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is looking for, this is the original thing I was looking for. And as I said, last few weeks, I found a bunch of other little goodies. But this is a cool thing that I was looking for. This reversion to the mean, back to the mean during the day. And here's what happened. And like the S&P 500, notice that this UVXY just chopped around. I have to be careful because I'm bearish and I'm bearish for good reasons, as you just saw. But I don't want to rush out and willy-nilly buy the UVXY when the market is trending higher or chopping higher or just chopping higher, chopping around and volatility is drying up. I want to wait for that volatility to expand and I also want to see the market sell off and then that's going to cause that volatility to begin to explode and that's where the real money is. Now, I didn't print money on this, but it's better than poking eyes. So it was narrow and choppy all day long. Here's the trades that I made. I think these are, yeah, this is Eastern time from this brokerage and you can see got in at 1320 and used a half a point trailing stop. It was later in the day. So I figured I wasn't gonna look for additional profit target. I probably should have, I guess it was hopeful, wishful thinking that it would just run for the close and it wouldn't take any profits. But I was looking for, a, I wanted to make at least a half a point on the first loaf. 
So I had a half a point trailing stop. Now keep in mind, this thing is really going crazy. A half a point, this thing can move a half a point in just a flash. But the fact that the market was persisting in one direction, and I figured that if I got in at 1320, at the time I got in, if it came all the way back down to third, let's say 1280 or 1270, then then I I'm totally wrong. Okay. Figure out where you're gonna be wrong. Don't be wrong. Okay, or don't be wrong for too long. I need to work on that. Dr. Seuss trading here. Little trailing stop. I did put in a trailing stop on 100% of it. Okay, so I did do that. The point I was trying to kind of back into a little bit is that something like the VIX, you can get a spike higher. So make sure you do put that IPT in there. Okay, late in the day like this, I'm like, ah, you know, it's got an hour left. I, it, it should be fine. It should be the keyword in that sentence. But sometimes, let's say, let's just assume this was uh, not the end of the day. This spike higher hit the IPT and this thing implodes and then you're at break even on this. At least you got paid. And believe me, this thing is a beast. Okay. Do not, if you're newer to trading, George, stay away from this for now at least. Okay. <laughs> or if you do trade 100 shares or something almost meaningless. But it can be a beast. So know the nature of what you're trading. Watch it for a long time. Get your ass handed to you a few times at 100 shares a clip or whatever size is nearly meaningless to you, maybe even 50 shares or whatever, and then begin to slowly increase your size. Okay. Hopefully it all made sense. <laughs> so you did SQQQ. Good, 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 good for you. Um, you know, I know you're doing a lot. You're doing the intraday trading, you're doing Classical technical analysis. Just uh, don't try to do too much, okay? Is what I've been preaching. All right, let's jump into. Um, oh, before we jump into crypto, just real quick, as I say, ad nauseum. My wife a while back said this Facebook group is the best thing I've ever done, and she meant it from a psychological standpoint because we're all kind of effed up in this business, right? You know, I make no bones about it. You you got to be a little crazy to be a trader. At least that's my excuse. <laughs> but it is nice seeing other people struggle a little bit. Not that you want to be shot on Friday, but it makes you feel normal that you're not the only one that struggles. And that's why I show you when I miss a huge trade. And a lot of times I'll show you when I when I take a trade, it turns into a stinker because shit happens, right? But the Facebook group has been great from that standpoint. And then from a monetary standpoint, you know, again, I I, I I'm pretty sure I would have hit refresh on my uh, on my gap scans right after the open like I normally do, but you know maybe I wouldn't have or or, or could did forgot or whatever. Who knows? I mean something might have happened around here and it's lots of craziness going on here around around here lately. Maybe I wouldn't have, you know. So thank you for that, and I'm glad I did. And that's that's right there. You could actually look at that is like, okay, well, I actually made money off of that. So, and hopefully you guys make a little money off of some of the stuff that I throw out too. Anyway, it's good stuff. You gotta be a gold member. Again, keeps the riffraff out, but love to have you. It's funny, every time I say that, it's like I get a whole bunch of requests and, you know, sorry, you gotta be a gold member, deny, deny, deny. You know, don't like doing that, but I have the Gestapo do that for me. All right, let me just, let's hop over to, uh, I'm gonna hop over to crypto for a second. I don't, I don't, that's probably not gonna be, anything really to look at, but I just want to show you a couple things. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at Bitcoin. Okay, so Bitcoin, if we didn't know anything about technical analysis, but you watched my YouTube a couple of weeks ago where I said, say hello to my little friend. And your little friend or my little friend is a 30 EMA. As long as a market is below the 30 EMA, okay, unless you had some other kind of pattern where it's all shaped up and could possibly set up below, which is going to be kind of rare from what I've seen, maybe a deep pullback in an IPO or something. But for the most part, if all you did was stay out of a market or short a market when it's below 30, you would do pretty good. You get whips out here and there, but look at the Look at what you would avoid, okay? 44,000 down to 28,000, okay? That's almost a 50% haircut. Maybe if you go all the way to the low, 
So you would have avoided losing half of your money just by getting out of the market when it's below 30. How about that, okay? So cash me outside, how about that? That girl made a lot of money. They may need a catchphrase. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at Ethereum, if I could find it. That's Ethereum to Bitcoin, not doing too hot, huh? Here's Ethereum. I was kind of a bull on Ethereum. I guess I didn't understand it, but uh, not doing so hot, as you can see. Longer term, I'm kind of a bull on Bitcoin. Here's what's interesting, though. No flight to safety in Bitcoin. The whole world was like, if the stock market comes unglued, you're going to be glad to have all that Bitcoin. Well, so far, not so good. So just looking at sorting by stronger pairs, and these things are just kind of all over the place. I see no reason to get too excited. I have really been doing a lot of crypto analysis lately, and I guess that's the time where you need to be begin looking at a market like this when it, it falls out of favor for when it begins to improve once again. But there's nothing exciting right now in crypto that I could find. Any uh, any crypto? Oh, you're welcome, George. Thanks for keeping it real. <laughs> oh, it's real. <laughs> okay, let me jump into the stock market unless you guys want to look at a crypto pair real quick. So we'll do that. All right. So let me just, let's go, let's take a look at the P's. And we'll go through this pretty quick because I've been saying a lot of this ad nauseum, and marketing them in and everywhere else. As I said earlier, look, we just chop it around this 30, okay? It's nothing to do, okay? Draw you some little trend lines or horizontal lines on top and on bottom. Now, today, we had something to do, okay? We'll see if we follow through. My big concern, as I've been saying, ad nauseum, is we take out the lows. There's no support for a long time. See, right here, we took out the low. That's a pretty serious drop. What's that drop? Let's just figure that out real quick. Uh, 7.5%. That's a pretty big drop, 7.5%. And then you can see that we obviously had that deep retrace. My big fear back here was that the market rallied just enough to get everybody back in and then spit them out. And that's what it did. As I often say, the market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most people and it'll also do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. So my buddies that when I told them right around here, it's like, hey, market's looking iffy. You might want to get out. He's like, oh, my guy's getting more aggressive. And then the other guy had the same guy, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, that'll work until it don't. And then the next few weeks, they're like, looks like the market's doing okay, huh? I'm like, eh, I don't know. You know, don't get me wrong. Again, I would never be shot on Friday. I wish it go going straight back up. Much easier to trade a bull market than a bear market, except on a day like today, okay, where you can go in. And uh, I was talking with one of you guys today, and <laughs> he's like, "Man, you always crush it on these on these route lowers uh, when the market implodes." And it's just, it's it's. I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's easier when the market's headed in one direction. And especially when you sit on your hands and wait for that to actually begin to occur. Now, don't worry, I get my ass handed to me quite often. So that one good day, we'll see if we, like I told this client, it's like I'm thinking about just uh, quitting tomorrow and that way I'll finish the week and have a decent week. NASDAQ Composite also stalled out at its, or beginning to sell off after tagging its, its 30 EMA. Notice we didn't get any Landry light at all. That was kind of cool. And then, this is looking ugly longer term, obviously. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty did have a little bit of Landry Light above, but don't rush out and buy a market because there's Landry Light. Take a look at what else is going on. Look at all that overhead supply we had. So you certainly don't want to buy with all this fluff above because anybody who bought during, during that range is looking to get out at break even. Okay, I'm running a little low on time, so if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, go ahead and do so now. The only thing that looks good to me is energies, and I've got quite a few on my momentum list, and I'm just waiting for a little bit more pullback, and I'm going to go after some of these. But look at the nice little Landry light we have on that 30 EMA. Nice, nice longer-term uptrend. That is absolutely beautiful. This is all-time highs here. I'd like to see a, a, a knockout move, a TKO type of move. 
which would be absolutely fabulous. Metals and Mining had a kind of a witch hat, deep retrace, and then began to implode. Looked like they would just go straight back up, right? So that's certainly not a good thing. Consumer and durables, as I've been saying, not doing so hot in here. Not that you want to rush out and trade these stocks, but it's interesting that people still eat and do other things that come along with eating in a bull in a bear market. And if you look at the foods, foods aren't doing too hot either, as you can see. They're kind of wide and loose and all over the place, but they're beginning to break down. So not a good place to run, a good place to hide. Sometimes those so-called defensive stocks, people will rush into those. Banks are all over the place, but they imploded today in a choppy downtrend. Biotechnology, not looking so hot. You can see it got whacked today, selling off pretty hard. Aerospace had a big old rally higher, defense, and then rolled right back over. That's kind of all over the place, but it's looking pretty ugly. Health services, the list goes on and on. Transports are all over the place, but they broke down hard today, and they're looking pretty ugly. Pretty ugly. Hey, it's an oxymoron from a trend following moron. I like that. Software not looking so hot. It did get a little bit above its 30 EMA, but then it rolled right back over. Notice it didn't take out this little high in here. So use like multi-day highs, use overhead supply, and a couple of other things. Don't just rush out and get excited because something gets above the 30. Okay. But definitely don't buy anything below the 30 as a general state. Let's take a look at bonds and we'll wrap it up with the dollar. Bonds, land your life to the downside, a little bit of an opening gap reversal, not much to get excited about. Good to see a little bit of flight to safety today. What makes me nervous is when bonds are down and gold is down and the stock market is down, that tells me it's a liquidation type of market. Now the dollar had a good day today, so that's a good thing. I'd like to see the dollar hang in there. My concern is if the dollar begins to, to implode, and as John or one of you guys pointed out a few weeks back, the UUP is just how well a dollar is doing against other currencies. It doesn't mean that the dollar is strong, <laughs> because we all know that uh, pretty soon, where's my 100 trade that one there? I saw it earlier. We'll all um, be, uh, you know, what's the thing? That th these are some new, uh, these are some new $1 bills. They're awesome. All right, any stocks? I know we talk stocks all day. Well, while we're at impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for watching. I appreciate you, you guys uh, showing up tonight. I appreciate anybody watching. Like it below, leave a comment. I read all comments and I do answer when uh, there is a question. So everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, I'll see everybody, all you guys and girls, I'll see you guys uh, and girls tomorrow and Facebook. Everybody have a great weekend, and we'll talk again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome, Sam. You're welcome, George.